One of the things which has really changed <coughs> in the modern era of genetics, and you've got to bear in mind that genetics as a science is really not much more than a hundred years old. That is, of course, Mendel, but Mendel's work from the 1860s was forgotten for half a, almost half a century. So it's only uh, about 120 years old as a science. Um, and uh, before that, we didn't really know anything about inheritance at all. And the strange thing is that genetics is about differences. If there were no differences, we wouldn't have any genetics. We'd be, we'd be clones. We'd be very simple clones, uh, you know, like, uh, like certain bacteria, for example. Uh, you need differences for genetics to exist, and you need genetics to exist for evolution to exist. So the study of differences is at the heart of the study of genetics. And what's very surprising, looking back at the recent history of the study of human differences, is how wrong everybody got it until perhaps about 50 or 60 years ago, uh, or 50 years ago really, I suppose it was. Uh, because if you, we as primates um, are different from the, all other primates, in that if we look across the world at the peoples of the world, Africans, Chinese, Asians, uh, Britons, Russians, uh, it's clear that if you look at different people, we look different. And if you look within a particular uh, population group uh, within Europeans or within Africans or within Chinese uh, uh, to, to a, a slightly um, uncritical eye, we look pretty much the same. And, you know, it's a racist thing to say, but, you know, to Europeans, all Chinese look the same. And to Chinese, they find it very hard to tell Europeans apart quite often. So the assumption was that the patterns of human diversity were, first of all, very strong on the, and on the surface which meant that underneath the surface, if we were to get towards the proteins and the DNA, we would find that within a particular population group, Africans or Europeans, shall, shall we say, everybody would be more or less the same, as they are in skin colour or facial appearance. And between the groups, between Africa and Europe, let's say, or between Russia and China, then the groups would be very, very different. And this gave rise to a, an era which uh, is still causing trouble today, which was in the e era of what was called scientific racism. And University College London, which is where we now are, was at the heart of that, because the f person who founded our laboratory, Francis Galton, um, Charles Darwin's cousin, uh, and who was in some ways the founder of human genetics, because he wrote a book called uh, uh, about, genetic, about, uh, about the inheritance of genius, Inherit uh, um, uh, he automatically assumed that there were huge differences in the, in, uh, in between different humans, but they were partitioned to different groups, not different individuals. And this led him to make some very unfortunate um, comments about the intellectual uh, excellence or otherwise of different groups. He assumed that if groups look different on the skins, they must be different in their blood, their bones, and their brains. And he wrote a notorious paper called Africa for the Chinese where he said that the Chinese were so much cleverer than the Africans that they should move into Africa and take it over because the differences were so great biologically and intellectually between the groups. And that was the feeling really I remember when I, even when I was a student in Edinburgh. Um, people you know, were all very liberal and left wing, but that was the model that people had of human difference. It was there and it was between the continents, not between people. And in fact, both here at UCL, University College London, um, and elsewhere, but first of all here at University College London, in the 1960s, that um, assumption was blown out of the water. And it was blown out of the water by Harrison Hopkinson um, in uh, a, what now seems an absurdly simple way. Uh, you've got to remember that in the 1960s we knew almost nothing about hidden genetic diversity in humans. We knew about blood groups, discovered by German Lowenstein 50 years before, 40 years before. We knew about blood groups, but we didn't really know about anything else. So what um, these two scientists did, and they, both of them were biochemists. They knew that you could take different enzymes and an esterase, shall we say, or a dehydrogenase, an enzyme that breaks down things like alcohol. They knew that you, we could, you could take these enzymes, you could purify them, and you could give them the uh, stuff which they work on, their substrate, and they would break it down. And it was already possible in those days to you know, do a cunning trick with particular chemical dyes, which would dye 
these enzymes uh, the, and the, what they, their breakdown products uh, with particular colours. And so they did something very, very simple, which is astonishing that hadn't been done before. They took a group of medical students, um, who they assumed to be typical, and a strange assumption to make, uh, but they took a group of medical students from here at UCL. And they looked at 47 of these different enzymes. Okay? And the assumption was very strongly in those days that every medical student, or almost every one, would have exactly the same um, structure of his or her alcohol dehydrogenase or, um, or esterase B or whatever you want to name. They would all be the same. There might be some tiny differences, but everybody would be the same. And it was a great surprise. In fact, it must have been quite a shock to discover that of the 47 um, uh, enzymes they looked at, 20 of them differed in their uh, structure from person to person. And they used a technique which, is, which became universal, which is called electrophoresis. And of course, en enzymes are made of proteins, they're made of amino acids, they're folded, they're little machines that, uh, that can chew away at different chemical substances, um, and amino acids are charged molecules, so that any difference in the order of the amino acids in an enzyme is liable to change the amount of charge on it, which may also change the shape of the molecule, and might also change the size of the molecule. Um, and so what they did was to take these samples of blood from the medical students and use the electrophoresis, which involves putting the um, samples onto a flat plate of starch, the starch which is used to make, to make, used to make wallpaper paste with, or bread with, it's simple stuff, it's like a, it's like a filter, put these uh, little samples in, apply a powerful electric current, and the, the enzymes will be pulled into the starch to an extent which depends on their shape, size and charge. And then you put the stain which responds to the activity of the enzyme um, onto the, onto the uh, piece of starch. That then stains where the enzyme is and it shows that for some of the enzymes there are two bands, sometimes more than two, ba two bands as you move across from one person to the next. So this is the first insight into hidden genetic variation. Okay. And I did a lot of this and, and, and a huge amount of this was done across the world using this technique to study what's called protein polymorphism. And I did it on snails, which nobody is interested in, but it's been done on everything you can possibly imagine. And in the human context, the results were basically astonishing, because the strong expectation that there would be differences between the races of the world uh, hasn't really held up. Okay, If you look at the uh, amount of genetic diversity in different human populations, uh, when we look at proteins, um, it's tiny compared, compared to the amount of genetic diversity between, shall we say, two groups of chimpanzees that look almost the same, that live a few hundred kilometers apart in West Africa. Um, and if you look outside Africa, um, the populations of the world roughly speaking, are more or less identical to each other. They're not entirely identical, but there's very little genetic difference between, shall we say, Russians and Welsh people, very little indeed. There's not much genetic differentiation between Chinese people and the people of South, the native people of South America. There's one exception to that, a slight exception to that rule, which is that if you draw, using diversity, a family tree of the peoples of the world, there's one very clear pattern. There is much, much more diversity within Africa and much more variation between African groups than there is outside Africa. And what that tells us is something we know already from the fossil record, that where every one of us across the world is an African. Uh, we are an African species of primate which got out of Africa really relatively recently. People argue about when, but the big exodus from Africa was probably only about 80,000 years ago. There may have been some smaller ones earlier. And since then we've moved across the world and filled it. And we haven't really changed very much in that time. But not only are there differences in the um, extent of um, the variation between Africa and, shall we say, the Middle East, uh, as we go further and further away from Africa, the amount of human diversity goes down. So the amount of variation, shall we say, in the most distant human populations from Africa, and they're the ones at the southern tip of South America, and they got there not by swimming the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. They got there by uh, getting into the Middle East, getting into northern Europe, into northern into Russia, crossing Russia, crossing Siberia, getting into Alaska and down into the Americas, 
only about 20,000 years ago, they have about 50% less variation than the people of Africa. And what that tells us is that there have been a series of bottlenecks, a series of tiny populations where small groups have moved on from place to place, losing genes by accident as they do. Okay. So that's the patterns you get from protein diversity. There's an interesting semi-political spin on that because I worked for a time in the laboratory in Chicago of somebody called Richard Lewontin, who was fairly well known and a man of strong political opinions. And I remember we were discussing uh, the di discoveries found over here at UCL and uh, the, the populations of the world were not particularly different. And Lewontin says, well, that's scientific proof that racism is wrong. And I was only 20, well, how old was I, 23 or so? And I said, well, that's not true. Racism is a political construct. It's not a scientific construct. Would it be uh, the case that if you found the races were different, Africans and Europeans, that would make racism right? Um, and he said he poo-pooed the idea. But of course, we have found differences between Africans and Europeans, but that has nothing to do with racism. Okay. Now, the era of protein polymorphism, now looking back on it, seems like the Middle Ages because the technology now is so sophisticated that we can go straight to the DNA and we can go we can sequence DNA at a rate and at a cost which was completely unthinkable even 10 years ago 10 years or a bit more ago it would have cost a hundred million dollars to sequence a uh, human DNA sequence now it's down to about a thousand dollars and it's going down as fast and it, people are being sequenced all over the world um, in Britain they started a thousand genomes project that was finished ten times faster than they expected. Then it went to a five thousand. Uh, then it went to a five thousand genomes project. Then a hundred thousand genomes project, and they're just talking about a five million genome project uh, where people will pay to have their DNA sequenced. Uh, whether that's a good idea for people to know their DNA sequence is a different question. Uh, but this is being done, and what it's telling us is that the amount of variation at the DNA level is un unspeakably enormous. So much so that every person in the world is different from everybody else in the world. Every person in the world who has ever lived or ever will live is different from everybody, every other person who ever has lived or ever will live. And even more remarkable, every sperm and every egg ever made in the world is different from all the others. Now, that's, they, these are genuinely astronomical figures about human difference. And they arise from the fact that through the 3,000 million bases of DNA, there are something like 3 million, at a rough guess, uh, sites which vary, can vary from one person to another. And it's like having a pack of cards with, with 3 million cards in it. It's not quite like that, but every time um, uh, sex takes place, uh, these cards are reshuffled and they come into new combinations. So what genetics has done is to make individuals of us all. We all now know that apart from identical twins, we are unique and I find that oddly comforting.